Why mediate? Why consider mediation? Mediation is pretty much no risk. There's no downside. 75% of mediation is successful. It's non-binding unless the parties want it to be binding, in which case an agreement is drawn up which can become an order of the court. So it can be final. It is confidential. It is without prejudice and it is informal and voluntary. So because it's not binding and the content of mediation cannot be used as evidence in the future, you can come out of mediation and having not achieved an agreement, you are able to go into uh, litigate back into litigation or into arbitration without having lost anything. So the worst case is uh, reverting to where you are, which is arbitration or litigation, and the best case is of course settling. Confidentiality is important because it avoids bad publicity and it avoids rumor mongering. Your mediator will not testify in court. Your mediator will destroy the documents at the end of the mediation. Mediation is voluntary. So that means that you can leave, or the mediator can leave, at any time with, for no reason at all. Mediation tends to preserve relationships. Burning bridges can be a poor idea. Mediation is being encouraged more and more by the courts. In fact, the courts are starting to frown on parties that are refusing mediation. Courts are getting full and the attempt to settle by mediation is even being met with penalties in some jurisdictions. Penalties that have been tested, I guess, are, for example, a denial of costs. So even if you win, uh, you will be denied the costs. So the bottom line is this. In more than 90% of cases, settlement happens. The expression settled on the courtroom steps is very real. That means that we spend a lot of time, money, stress to get to a point to get to the courtroom steps and then we settle. It doesn't make much sense. And mediation costs a fraction of a litigious process. Consider mediation. It's a smart thing to do. What exactly is mediation? Let me start off with what mediation is not. Mediation and arbitration are completely different. Arbitration is an adjudicative process. In other words, you're handing over the control, you and the person that you have the dispute with are relinquishing the ability to customize an agreement that works for both of you. So a third party, an arbitrator, would um, refer to rules and laws and whatever and make a, make a ruling which is final and binding. So. The difference with mediation is that you control the process. There is no agreement unless you and your counterpart agrees to that. Mediation is often referred to as assisted negotiation, which it really is. But this has nothing to do with the necessity to assist experienced negotiators. Negotiating with somebody represents what you can see, what you can hear, and what you can feel of each other. You don't get more than your counterpart wants to give you. Now, if you use the analogy of an iceberg, you're seeing what is above the water. What the underlying interests are is below the water. Understandably, 
Nobody wants to volunteer information that can be valuable. Nobody wants to put forth their weaknesses if they're heading for a possible court case. Nobody wants to talk about their underlying interests because a lot of the time people don't think it has anything to do with a dispute, which it may not, but it may very well be a key to unlocking or a key to making a mini trade or trades. There are things that we don't realize that somebody else may want and vice versa. That's the job of the mediator. The mediator will explore what is underneath the water at the bottom of the iceberg. Can't explore it without being told that. When the mediator is told that, he's told that in private and confidential session. So nothing gets heard by your counterpart. So for the mediator to access below the water, which is what the mediator's job is, the mediator has to receive the information. That information has to be received in a way that is safe, confidential, and not accessible to the other side if it's going to be completely laid out on the table. The mediator will use that information to look for opportunities to bring about a meeting of the minds. And those opportunities cannot be accessed by two people negotiating on their own. So ignoring access to that underlying information is a surefire way to leave value on the table. Mediation works by assigning a person who is independent and neutral and perceived to be neutral to help the parties develop a big picture view of the situation in an objective way. A mediator can see things from a completely fresh point of view. Active listening is a very important part of the mediation process. It allows for venting and venting is crucial. Not only does it make each party feel better, but as you speak, as you vent, all sorts of ideas come into one's head. And it can generate a lot of creativity and a lot of perspective. So how does mediation work in practice? Typically, you'd start off by reading an agreement because the agreement will contain a lot of the ground rules. The mediator will welcome everybody, introduce him or herself, give an overview of what the process is, take any questions, and then ask one of the parties to make an opening statement, very briefly, of the key points of why there is a dispute from that party's point of view, the mediator may interrupt a little bit to get clarity, but the other party cannot do that. The other party may make notes in order to bring up certain points when they have a turn. It'll switch to the other party, the same thing will happen in reverse, and that may go back and forth a little bit. The other part of the process that is very important is what we refer to as caucusing. Caucusing is simply private session where one party will discuss his or her concerns, underlying interests, weaknesses, strengths with a mediator and the mediator will help to reframe that or put that into perspective in a certain way will reality test the assumptions. For example, if so-and-so doesn't want to agree, then I'll sue him. Well, a reality test would be, um, have you checked what it would cost to sue him or her? 
And in most court systems, are you absolutely sure that you would win? That would be a reality test. It would never be saying it. It would be asking or asking the person to consider or asking the person to find out. That would give the mediator a certain base from one side. Switch to the other side, ask the person always that is going to be waiting to uh, consider certain things or to make a phone call or to discuss with uh, the lawyer or something like that while they're waiting so that they can come back into session or come back into the private session and having thought about some of the aspects possibly have some fresh ideas. The mediator will take those ideas and use all of that information, particularly the information from the private sessions, and study them, delve into them, and see where there are possible matches, where there are possible ways of bringing the parties together, usually in small chunks, not as an entire agreement. Most agreements are made up of little agreements. So this is not possible between opposing parties, where one has a viewpoint that says black and the other one has a viewpoint that says white, there is no room to negotiate. And that's the reason that mediation is such a valuable resource. When is the right time to mediate? Before the first shot is fired and after negotiation has been attempted. The minute that a lawyer's letter of demand goes out, for example, you're entering a zone of escalation. And escalation is very difficult to stop. It becomes a tit-for-tat game, which ends up usually in settlement, in a sort of mediation at the far end after all of the costs have been wasted. Money, time, stress, even knock-on effects on family. So don't fire that first shot before trying mediation. The first shot actually triggers a, a, a second tier of quarrels which adds further to escalation that can run away. So if discussions are failing or have failed, that's the time to fire a shot, not before. Where is the best place to mediate? Well, for mediation to deliver on its promise, it has to be cheap. Flying all over the place and taking off time, usually for several people, hotels and so forth, is an expensive business. So more and more online mediation is taking over from live or face-to-face -face mediation. And it has a lot of advantages besides the, uh, the costs. The technology that's being used is highly secure. We've come into a phase of um, video conferencing that is well advanced and is now becoming acceptable from a confi confidentiality point of view and from a practical point of view in terms of um, being able to lock a room, for example, so nobody can get in, even if they have a password. Lock a room would be locking off the, um, the meeting, the, the online meeting from anybody else. So the principles are the same as face-to-face -face mediation. This is not uh, a Skype. This is much more advanced than Skype and it is much more in keeping with the requirements of, of mediation. 
You'd be sitting anywhere in the world on a computer or a iPad or a handheld or a smartphone. All of them work very well. And you'd be looking at a screen of, let's say, uh, two other people, a mediator and your counterpart in a simple situation, and yourself. So you'd be looking at three frames, and the mediator would be doing, and everyone else would be doing, exactly the same as they would in a in a face-to-face -face mediation. As far as the um, advantages of that are, is that you don't have to be in the same room as your, as your counterpart. You may not be on very good terms. The technology does not require that you have an email address or any type of contact uh, details of your counterpart. So there's lower risk of, uh, of any abuse. So if, the, if a private session is needed, uh, you'd be asked to leave the session and you'd see a black screen and you would because you're in your own space you have usually something to do you could you could get a cup of coffee you go and check your email or so forth and that's efficient for time uh, although it's very important to think about what's going on and see if you can come up with any ideas or considerations while you're waiting. The other thing is that there are two types of online mediation. What we've just talked about is called synchronous mediation where everybody's around at the same time in the room or on hold. The other type is asynchronous mediation which is where you're online but not at the same time. And online mediation is usually a mix of the two, depending on how things progress. Online mediation could mean, I need to have a private session with you, let's do it. And the other person does not have to be around or anything. And then the following week, uh, I need to have a private session with the other person. Uh, same thing. It could extend into emails, it could extend into phone, and usually does extend into phone calls and so forth. So it's a very efficient way of doing things. The other thing about asynchronous mediation is that it gives the mediator time to consider things, maybe even to consult with peers, anonymously of course, and to digest a lot of what has been going on rather than having to be on the spot and making decisions sometimes too quickly. The party is the same thing. Have a chance to absorb and to reflect on the whole thing while they're waiting for the for the next session. The party is also having some time to absorb and consider their what's known as their BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, -A, or the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In other words, if you don't make an agreement during mediation, then what is plan B? And how might plan B look? Online mediation is very valuable and has given us a tremendous advantage in doing things even more efficiently and at lower cost. Who is the mediator? The mediator should be highly trained. Mediators should uh, have a good grounding in dispute settlement, uh, conflict theory, conflict management. But possibly more importantly, a mediator should have experience in life. Experience in witnessing what conflict can do and what conflict is all about and preferably one that has made a lot of mistakes in their own careers or their own lives and seen what the alternatives might have been in retrospect. I did my post-grad in dispute settlement in Stellenbosch University in South Africa. I am a accredited mediator with 
the Centre for Dispute Resolution, or CEDA, of London. I'm accredited to conduct psychometric testing using a very specialised conflict, specifically conflict behaviour tool, as opposed to conflict character or conflict personality, because behaviour is really what counts at the end of the day. And I am a trainer. I'm a trainer of mediation, accredited by Mediation Training International or Eckerd College in Florida in the US. And I've studied group mediation at Pepperdine University, also in, in the US, in California. Most important part of it though, is that I have been in my own businesses as a f for many years. I've had manufacturing experience, I've had retailing experience, and I wanted to use the expression that I come from the street. I come from an industry, I come from the jewelry industry, which is very competitive in nature. It's an adversarial type of an industry where um, people are not rough, but the idea of um, settling things through mediation is something that is new. Because of that background, I can look back and see the mistakes that I made. There are so many instances that I can remember that would have been so much better if I had known how to deal with them in a more collaborative way. I would have made more money. It was pretty successful, but things would have been better for those particular circumstances. And they came up every day. It's in retrospect and with delving into it and training and learning that I've come to realize that there's a lot of things that can be done a lot better.